Happy birthday, dear church. Happy birthday to you. Amen. I was like, wait, did I put your candles on here? All right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, hey, it's being defiant. Yeah, right. There it is. There it is. May the fire on my oh, cake never burn out. All right. See, y'all thought last week I was kidding when I said I like chocolate cake. Not Zane again. All right. So today we are celebrating Pentecost, which is the church's birthday. And <clears throat> what's interesting is, uh, you know, when I blew out the candles, you know, how, how, do we, how do we normally make the candles go out? You know, uh, do we spit on them? I mean, some kids do. You, you see those videos of like the two, three-year-old, and, ah, and it's like, that's okay, you just ruined the cake. Uh, especially when they like get like those really nice cakes that were like $200, and it's like, you just, okay. <laughs> don't, don't get a really nice cake for a small kid, just saying. Anyway, or at least have that as the backup, the, the candle is I digress. But how we put out the candles on a cake is through wind. Now, it's interesting. Um, how many of you have ever gotten the wind knocked out of you? Right? And so if I were to get the wind knocked out of me and try to blow out the candles on the cake, nothing would happen. Right? Uh, even a couple of weeks ago, I was working on my truck uh, and I was changing the brakes on the truck. Uh, change one side, no problem. Go to the second side, and it turns out I had to actually get new calipers, which are the things that push against the brake pads that uh, and against the rotor that cause the car, the vehicle to stop. And so the caliper piston was stuck, and I couldn't get it out. Now normally you get a C clamp; it's this vice thing. You just screw it in, boom, no problem. I didn't have a C clamp. All I had was a large pair of channel locks. Not ideal, because I could only get one tooth on either side. And so I was trying everything I could to compress this caliper. And then I started getting worried. I called to other shops cause, uh, and saying, hey, do you, do you have this? And there was nothing near me. And so I was getting worried, because I'm like, I don't put this on. I can't go home, because I was at work. I was not at my house. And I was at work on a weekend where everybody else isn't there. So I was, I was getting quite concerned. And so I got these channel locks. I got one handle up against my chest. The other handle I was pulling with all of my might. And then all of a sudden I felt my rib move. And I heard a... And then it popped back into place. Guess what happened next? <laughs> I got the wind knocked out of me. And, and, and having the wind knocked out of me is not an uh, experience that I'm unfamiliar with. I was a crazy kid. I'd be like jumping out of trees and off of buildings and all kinds of stuff, getting into fights. So, I mean, I've gotten the wind knocked out of me a lot. And it is not a fun experience. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 records that God breathed into Adam and he became a living being. But after the fall, God said, look, you can do anything, you can have anything, you can eat anything you want except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, you eat of that fruit, the day that you eat it, you're going to die. And people said, why would a good God even put that as an option? Two things. One is that love, for it to be love, has to have a choice. There had to be an option for Adam to not choose God if it was going to be genuine love. The second thing, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil did not add anything to Adam, and that was the lie of the enemy. See, he had only known the perfection and the completeness of God. When he ate of that, the, the fruit, what happened is his spirit died. His connection to God died that very day. He got the God breath knocked out of him. And he now was experiencing and had firsthand knowledge of what it's like to live imperfect as death began to set in on him and that he would finally experience physical death 969 years later. And humanity has been gasping for air for nearly 4,000 years until Jesus finally came. This was the one who the, the scriptures were saying was going to make it all right again. And he comes, his ministry, and then he dies. 
but he doesn't stay in the grave. He resurrects three days later. He hangs out for 40 days and is talking to his disciples, explaining so many things about the kingdom. And he says, look, I got to go now. But it's good that I go away because if I leave, I'm going to send the helper and he's going to come. Jesus ascends into heaven and then 10 days later, the breath of God, the same thing that made Adam a living being in the garden, made us alive as he birthed the church. Today, we are celebrating that birth. And the account is found in Acts chapter 2. And the first verse says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Now, I want to stop there. A lot of times we read this verse and we just jump right into the fire and the tongues and all of that. And that's very important. But to understand what comes next and the significance, I want us to understand this day, Pentecost. Um, And so we need to ask ourselves some questions. What is Pentecost and when did it start being celebrated? Pentecost means 50. Everybody say 50. 50. Get ready. I'm going to say it a bunch tonight. So Pentecost means 50, and it was instituted at Mount Sinai. The children of Israel were enslaved in Egypt for 430 years. And then God raises up a deliverer in Moses. There are the 10 plagues of Egypt. In the first nine, the, the, the Pharaoh is saying, no, I'm not going to let the people of Israel go. Finally, the 10th comes, and it's the death of the firstborn And after that, Pharaoh says, fine, you guys, you know, not only can you go, but please go. The children of Israel are delivered from Egypt. And so Pentecost was a festival of first fruits of the wheat harvest. Everybody say wheat harvest. harvest. Extremely important. Uh, It's also known as the Feast of Weeks. Well, why is that? Well, because there were seven weeks in this festival. And there are seven days in a week. Seven times seven equals 49. And then the next day was celebrated as the culmination of that. So you get 50, ergo Pentecost. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 10, God says, Then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God uh, with the tribute of a free will offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. Now, this is interesting. He's saying, here's how we're going to celebrate this. That the culmination of this 50-day period after the Passover is going to, one of the ways that you're going to celebrate this is by giving a free will offering. So if I were to tell you, uh, freely give me any amount you want in the amount of $10, is that that a free will offering? Well, no. No. Uh, But if I say, you know what, whatever you have that I want you to enter in this process of blessing. See, here's the thing. God, he's not after your money. And no, I'm not going off on a tangent on tithing right now. But God is not after your money. What he says is, I want you to be like me. The word also says that the lesser is always blessed by the greater. So when we give to God, we can expect a blessing in return, not just because his word says so, but because he's faithful. The word says, test me in this. Leviticus chapter 23 verses 15 through 20 also describe what the priests were to offer at the culmination of this festival. Um, it, is, it says that they were to give a wave offering to the Lord. Now, a wave offering is exactly what it sounds like. They would take the offering of whatever it is and literally wave it before the Lord. Why? Because God has bifocals, you know, is he, is he farsight? We need to say, hey, no. Okay, there, no, it's extremely significant. Um, and I'm going to get into that in a second. Uh, and so he says, all right, you're going to take these two loaves of bread. You're going to wave them before the Lord. There's also going to be um, some lambs that you're going to sacrifice. And you need to do some stuff with the blood. So you have blood of a lamb. You have the wave offering. And then you have, um, uh, he said, there's also a drink offering that's associated with that, which was wine. You guys see what's going on here. You have the blood of the lamb. And because of the blood of the lamb and the forgiveness of sin, now 
you have the bread, which is symbolic of revelation and relationship with God that is being waved before the Lord, and you have a drink offering, they're taking communion. And so two loaves, what are the two loaves about? Now the Bible, and we'll, we'll touch on this a couple of times, uh, the word is very clear. Uh, Jesus uses bread as analogy all the time, uh, grain, all of that. The, the bread is indicative of the word of God or of revelation. Jesus even is known as the bread of life. And so Jewish tradition says that the two loaves of bread are symbolic of the two tablets that the Ten Commandments were written on. So it is a celebration of the day that the law was given. But there's a deeper prophetic significance to that as well, is that this is the only festival that had bread with leaven in it, or yeast, or a rising agent. See, every other festival said that you were to have bread without any leaven. This is a matzah. And so the reason why is because leaven or yeast was, a, uh, was representative of sin. And so he says, when you eat, you are not to ingest anything that is sin. Today, the prophetic manifestation of that is that we need to be careful with what we watch, what we hear, what we say, what we're allowing in our gates. God doesn't care whether or not you eat yeast. What he's saying is do not put sin into your life. But this festival is different. There are two loaves of leavened bread, and this is the only feast where this happens. What is that about? Because the prophetic significance is of the Old Testament nation of Israel. And then you also have Gentiles, that we all have sinned, all have sinned before the Lord and fallen short of his glory. But thanks be to God, we have a high priest who broke the bread of his own body that says, yes, they are full of sin, but God, you see what I have done, and therefore I'm going to raise up a people for your name's sake, that you and I have a life and a hope in Jesus Christ because he, as our great high priest, with us and all of our sin, has offered us up before the Lord and said, these are the ones who I love. We are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, and the Lord then shares with us the bread and the wine. We can now have communion with God. We can now have a relationship with Him. We can now experience the Holy Spirit. We can now go boldly into His throne of grace and into His presence. You see, Jesus was God's first fruit, free will offering. And before God ask us to give anything. It says that before the earth was even made, Christ was already crucified. God already knew that he was going to give his son. In fact, in the most quoted scripture in the Bible says, and you can say it with me, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, our sin problem, God gives us the tools of transformation, but it's him who does it in us. I cannot get the yeast out of my life without him. I cannot turn a loaf of bread into matzah, but the power, but Jesus's mercy and his redemption and his grace, he's saying, I, by the power of my Holy Spirit, will empower you that even though you're a loaf of bread, I can cause you to live a matzah life. John, or Isaiah 53 verse 5 uh, speaks of Jesus hundreds of years before he comes onto the scene. And it, he prophetically writes that he was, speaking of Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. See, we were separated from the Father because of our sin. And the Son paid the price for our redemption. He sent his Holy Spirit so that we can know him, we can walk with him, we can talk with him and commune or have a relationship with him. Did you know that the God of the universe, the one who spoke in Genesis 1 and said, let there be light, also wants to speak into your life 
and say, let there be purpose. Let there be hope. Let there be forgiveness. Let there be future. Let there be legacy. And why can we hear the voice of God? Because we celebrate Pentecost. See, Jesus did much more on the cross than just cleanse us of our sin. His body, his life, his ministry became seed that would result in a harvest of many spiritual sons and daughters. In John chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, this phrase means, hey, pay attention. What I'm about to say is extremely important. He said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Paul repeats this idea where he says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Death works in me, but life works in you. See, Paul understood the secret of multiplication. I got to die to who I am. I got to die to, not who I am, but I got to die to my selfishness so that Christ can live in me. The Lord is saying, look, I'm not trying to strip you of your personality. I'm trying to strip you of your selfish baggage that keeps you from running the race I've I've created for you. See, Jesus is the bread of life and bread is made of flour, which is what? Crushed grain. It's crushed wheat. So again, wheat or grain is an analogy of the word or revelation. Jesus is the word made flesh that was given and crushed on the cross as the first fruit of the harvest of souls for his church. Again, Pentecost means 50 or the 50th day. And to really understand the power of Pentecost, uh, we need to look at what it is 50 days after. So we understand Pentecost, 50 days. So what came before? Uh, Well, it was Passover. Again, it was the death of all the firstborn in Egypt. It is the uh, Hebrew word, Shavuot. Uh, And so it's 50 days after Passover. And so what happened is that the angel of death was sent out to kill all of the firstborn in every household. And there was only one way of escape. You had to take a lamb kill it, and take the blood of the lamb and put it over the doorpost. Now, did you know that this was not just for the nation of Israel? If there were any Egyptians who did this as well, they were also spared. If there were any Jewish people who did not do this, then the angel of death would come into their home and their firstborn would die. So the qualifications for life, hear me people, was not whether or not they were Jewish. The qualifications for life is whether or not they trusted God enough to put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And right now, salvation is not about where you come from. It's not about your lineage. It's not about who your grandparents were. He's saying, if we have faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, if we apply the blood in the doorpost of our heart by having faith in him of repenting of our sin and turning to him and thanking him for what he did for us on the cross and living a life that honors honors him, he says that salvation will come to your house and it won't just save you, it'll also save your children. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said in John chapter 1 verse 29, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, Jesus is our Passover Lamb. Again, Pentecost means... 50. Now, I want us to understand the Old and the New Testament significance of this. In the Old Testament, you had 50 days from Passover. So from the time that uh, the angel of death passed over them and the next day they left Egypt, it was 47 days until they got to the Mount of Sinai. And God said, all right, you need to prepare yourself for three days because I'm going to come down. And when I do, I'm going to give you what is now known as the Ten Commandments. So after 50 days from leaving Egypt, they received the law. New Testament, 50 days when Jesus was crucified, which was actually also on Passover. There was a giving of the Spirit. 
Let me say it this way. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, Paul writes and he says, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. See, in the Old Testament, 50 days after Passover, you, they were given the law. And as Moses was going down, God said, hurry up and get down there. They've created this golden calf. They've already gone into idolatry. And now that I've given you the law, there has to be judgment. And so Moses goes down. He's angry with the people. He's like, what is the matter with you? You don't see the fire, the smoke, the thunder. The God's right. He's, he's like, he's right there. And so he says, all right, how many of you? He calls to all of the tribes of Israel. And he says, all of you, who among you are on the Lord's side? Only one tribe responded, the tribe of Levi. And so the Levites came to Moses and said, all right, take up your swords, go into the camp and start killing those people that were involved in the idol worship. And so they did. And then finally God said, stop. The number of slain that day because of the law was 3,000. That is a crazy way to enter the ministry. Because of that act, God called the Levites as the priests. See, before that, God wanted the entire nation of Israel to be priests. Just like us, it's not just about, oh, well, I'm going to put my anointing and spirit on the pastor or on the staff or the administrative team. God says, no, you are all a holy people, a royal nation. You are all to be prophets, priests, and kings before the Lord. It is God's desire that he give authority and the ability, what does it mean to be a priest? It means to minister the, to the people before the Lord and to minister before the Lord for the people. And so it's God's desire that we are a people that do that, not just the few. But how many of you would like to enter ministry that way? See, all Danny and Ruby had to do was take a test. <laughs> the Levites took a test that day, a little bit different. I digress. But then in the New Testament, we see that after the Passover, Jesus dies on the cross. He's around, he resurrects. He's around for 40 days. He ascends. And then after 10 days, the Holy Spirit comes. Peter delivers one of the most amazing messages in church history. Again, remember, Old Testament, the law was given, which brought 3,000 deaths. In the New Testament, Peter preaches by the power of the Holy Spirit, and there were 3,000 that were added to the church that day. There were 3,000 spiritual lives. See, the letter of the law can only come to show you where you've fallen short and to kill you. But God, that's not his desire. He doesn't want to have children to kill you. He says, I've come in the power of Pentecost to give you my Holy Spirit, not just to hold you to the letter of the law, but I want you to understand my heart and my mind. I want to give you the power to walk it out, I want you to understand the spirit of the law, the intent, not just saying you cross that line, you're dead, but that you understand the nature of that line. See, Adam and Eve did not understand that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was going to take away from them, that they already had fullness. There was nothing to be added. You can't add to perfection. That their knowledge, they weren't gaining new information. They were now experiencing complete deficiency. Deficiency in their work. Deficiency in their relationship with God. Deficiency in their relationship with each other. One of the most useful definitions or helpful that I've heard, definitions of death, is separation. You separate the body from the soul, that's death. You separate the spirit from God's spirit, which is what happened to Adam, that's death. But it wasn't just a spiritual death that he died. His marriage died that day. His career died that day. His legacy died that day. His children, did they go on and do amazing things for the Lord? No. The oldest one committed the first murder in cold blood. That was his legacy. In John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, I still have so many things that I want to say to you, but you can't bear them now. You, your hearts and your minds are already so full. I can't pour any more into the cup. It'll just overflow. He says, however, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He's going to take your capacity that you have now and expand it. 
and he's going to completely continue to pour in. He says he will guide you into all truth. How much truth? See, I love the word of God. See, God doesn't say, here's the law book, figure it out later. I'll see you when you die on my judgment throne and we'll talk about how well you did. No, he says, look, you can't fulfill the law. I've done it for you in Jesus Christ and I've given you the power. See, Jesus said, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Ah, I, I, I can't even be good most days. What are you talking about perfect? You know, we have a phrase uh, in the military about passing our PT test. You get a 95%. Uh, it's not impossible to do, but if you're not working out like on a daily basis, it's, it's pretty difficult. Uh, and so if, you're not getting, if you get a 95%, you know, you get a, a b- bunch of benefits. You get to go home early. Uh, you don't have to take the test for an additional six months, all of this stuff. But short of that, the minimum is 75. 75, same as 94. You know, and, and on my best day, Spiritually, I'm just trying to get a 75, y'all. <laughs> like, the word even says that my righteousness is as filthy rags before God. But Jesus comes and he says, look, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. And when I say be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect, he's saying, look, I'm not giving you permission to fail. I'm not giving you permission to sin. I'm not giving you permission to stay down when you fall. You, you need to understand that the standard of God's holiness, it should be the standard of your life. Make his perfection your goal. And in that place where you fail uh, every day, that you're coming to, you, Jesus saying, come to me and I'm going to make it all right. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to talk with you. And I'm going to show you how to stand a little longer. You know, there's this idea that if you can do something for a short amount of time, you should be able to do it forever. Well, try holding a gallon of water out in front of you. Try doing a plank. Try, you know, any of the, you you get it. That, yeah, the first five seconds, easy. I could win Olympic medals with the first five seconds of holding that joker there. Anything after that is anybody's guess how long that's going to stay up, right? I tried that once. I don't remember how long I got, but I remember at the end of it, I lost the use of my arm for that entire day. That was stupid. (laughs) And sometimes it feels like that, trying to follow God. When we're doing it in our own strength. See, God never told you to hold the standard of God out by yourself. He said, hold the standard of God in your heart and your mind and make that your goal. And when you stumble, because it's going to happen, though you stumble, he will not let you fall. That he sends the power of the Holy Spirit to come and to pick you up. One of the most famous stories in athletic history was by a gentleman who never won any award. He never broke any records. He was in a preliminary uh, race for the Olympics, and he was about to get in it. And halfway through, he was pushing ahead of everybody, but then all of a sudden, you see a roll come up in his leg, and he comes down and crashes down. He tore uh, his hamstring, and he's in excruciating pain. And there, the medics come, and they're trying to get him off of the track, and he pushes them all away. And he's saying, get out of here. I, I, you know, and so he's, he's, he's going to his feet, and now he's hopping along, hopping along. And then you see another wave come up his leg, another tendon. And, and so then he falls again, same thing, medics, and he's pushing him away. Now he's barely limping, but he's still going down the track. And then all of a sudden, there's a gentleman that breaks through the crowd and, and, and jumps onto the track. Security tries to tackle him. You see this man like the Hulk, just pushing him away. He's not being aggressive, but he is do, desperately trying to get to this man. And then you see they zoom in on the runner, and he's saying, that's my dad. That's my dad. And so the father runs, and he picks him up. Now, the father doesn't pick him up off the ground and move him off the track He says, I'm going to walk with you every agonizing step. And he walked step by agonizing step until finally they got to the finish line. Look, it doesn't matter how fast you run. Paul says there's sometimes in this race you can't even take another step. But the Holy Spirit is to make sure you stand. Stand, therefore, when there's this opposition coming against you. God is saying that on your worst day, he is your best friend. He is your advocate. He is your father. He is the presence, power, and personality of God as your heavenly father that puts his arm around you and says, just one more step. God, I can't run today. All right, but can you stand? The Holy Spirit reveals the will, the word, and the heart of Jesus to us. 
You know, I grew up in church. I had read through the Bible several times, and I definitely had my fill of church and, shall I say, church folks. And I, I, when I uh, became a teenager, I went through some things, and I was, I was done. I was done with the church. I was done with uh, uh, God. And I was saying, look, the church is supposed to be your representation of love. If this is your love, I certainly don't want anything to do with them, and I don't want anything to do with you. I'm done. I'm out. And for six years, I went to crazy town. I said, I was trying my best to be the good Christian. That didn't work. So I'm going to go the other way. And I thank God in his infinite mercy that he, for some reason, decided to call me back home into his kingdom. And when he did, I mean, his, his love, truth, and power began just rushing in my life. He gave me a sense of peace that I had never known before. And one of the most remarkable things about this time is that basically I didn't do anything except go to work, sleep, eat, and read the word. And it was every time I opened up the scripture, it was as if the Holy Spirit came and sat right down next to me. And as I read things, he said, yeah, you thought this meant this, but this is actually what this means. Yeah, you understand this principle, but you don't understand its prophetic significance. Go back over here. Oh my gosh. Because I, 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 the Lord is saying, all right, before you start, don't just read a book. This isn't an academic exercise. Ask to know me. See, we serve a God who says, if any of you lacks wisdom, all you have to do is ask. And he will give us wisdom. How does he give us wisdom? By sending his Holy Spirit. You want to know how to revolution? How many of you have ever read the Bible and say, I have no idea what I'm reading? Well, that makes perfect sense. It's an ancient Eastern book read with a modern Western mindset. Not a lot of that is going to make sense. But one thing I promise, if you sit down to the Word every day and pray this simple prayer, Lord, show me Jesus. Holy Spirit, teach me your Word. He will show up and He will do it. See, Jesus said that it was good that He goes so another could come. I mean, you're talking about God in human form. This is the word of God and in the flesh. What do you mean it's good that you go? He says, if I don't go, then the other one can't come. Because Jesus could only be in one place at one time talking to only one group of people. And if he was having a one-on-one, guess what? That's the only one-on-one he could have. But when he sent the Holy Spirit, now he could be with everyone, everywhere, at all times. Pentecost is a celebration of the giving of the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus to us and to empower us to be like him. The the Bible says that he who started a good work in you will finish it until the day of Jesus Christ, that we go from glory to glory as we behold him. The more the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to us, the more like Jesus we become. You want to know how to deal with that addiction? You want to know how to break that family cycle? You want to know how to bring hope into that situation? The answer is not in trying harder. You cannot kill your flesh by an effort of the flesh. Wait, what? What? No, what's happening there is whack-a-mole. And, and t- nine times out of ten, it's not like you push one mole down and then t- one comes up. It's like hydra moles. You cut one off, ten more pop up over here saying, okay, the struggle is real. It's not just real, it's overwhelming. And it's sucking away my hope. And it's causing my fears to close in around me. And the frustration is mounting. And, and what do I do? And the Holy Spirit says, enough. It is finished. So how do we get to that place where we find hope, freedom, clarity, power, peace in his presence? It's in his presence. The Lord says, I'm enthroned in the praises of my people. If you are struggling with oppression, it may be that you're complaining and allowing too much negativity to come out of your mouth. Turn your complaining into praising and you will find the Holy Spirit as you welcome him in to change your perspective. And it's not just about whack-a-mole. He's saying, come to me and I will work with you and within you. The Bible says that it is the Holy Spirit of God that works within us both to will, which means to want to, and to do, not just want to, but do, for his good pleasure. How many of you want to conduct yourself according to what God likes? You can't do it on your own. And I mean this with every fiber of my being. You can't be good enough. 
You can't be righteous enough. You can't give enough money. You can't serve a number of hours. You can't do it on your own. But Jesus, he's already done it. And he said, just come to me. Mary and Martha, I love this. Martha's busy. She's making sandwiches, doing the dishes, you know, cleaning, you know, vacuuming, the food, doing all the stuff. And Mary's just sitting there listening to Jesus. And he said, Jesus, come on, man. You see all the stuff I'm doing? I'm married. Get off these doors all soon. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're worried about so many things. You're so busy that you've missed the key of being productive. She's chosen the better part to sit and listen at my feet. Now, does that mean that we don't work? All we do is just listen to, you know, worship and, and, and teaching all day. And, well, I, I don't even need to get a job because just the Holy Spirit going to feed me and pay my bills. No, that's not how this works at all. We do need to work. He didn't say that Mary is 100% right and Martha, you're 100% wrong. He said, no, we need to work. But Mary, so she can work later has given priority or preeminence. She's understanding that the foundation is sitting in the presence of Jesus so that when she works, look, just because you're busy doesn't mean you're productive. Just because you're exhausted after a long day and there's been a lot of motion doesn't mean that you have fruit in your life. God says, this is how you give God glory, that you're super busy. No, he says that you bear much fruit. See, a lot of us are like rocking chairs. Lots of motion, not going anywhere. And so Pentecost means 50. Now this number, I'm going to try to go through this very quickly. I'm very careful when it comes to looking at the prophetic significance of numbers. There's a thing called numerology where people read into it almost as if it's like, you know, tarot cards or they're trying to like tell the future by numbers. And look, that stuff's ridiculous. But the enemy will always try to pervert and create a counterfeit for something that is legitimate from God. So numbers do have prophetic significance. And if you dismiss the prophetic significance of numbers, you actually miss quite a lot. It doesn't mean that you're looking for numbers in absolutely everything, but uh, I, I just want to point out a few numbers here that are extremely important to the experience of Pentecost. So Pentecost is the number... 50, which is comprised of the number 40 plus 10. 40 is a number of cleansing. Now, I can prove this very easily. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus, now Jesus wasn't cleansed in the wilderness because he was already pure, but he was doing the work for our cleansing 40 days and 40 nights. The children of Israel were 40 years in the wilderness for them to get purified. Uh, I could, their 40 is all over the Bible. And what's interesting is 40 is also comprised of 5 times 8. 5 is the number of grace. Grace, is, and I need to be careful not to preach too much on this point, grace is the supernatural power of God so that you can do what you could not do before. It is unmerited favor. It is God's blessing and power. You know, <laughs> for the things that I have done against my king, I deserve to die. And not only has he just said, all right, fine, I'm not going to kill you. But he said, look, I'm not going to make you work it off the rest of your life. I've already done the work on the Christ, cross. Now live your life according to what I've called you to do. His mercy, his forgiveness, his grace, I don't deserve it. That's why it's mercy. And so the grace of God is an essential ingredient to having a successful life. Now, we take this number eight. It means new beginning. So if you look at a musical scale, there are seven major chords, and then the eighth starts a new octave. And so, and that's just one example, but I can show you eight, uh, you know, there's seven days in a week. So the eighth would start a new week, so on and so forth. So you have grace times a new beginning, five times eight. And that brings you to 40, which is a cleansing or a time of transition where God is removing the old to prepare you for the new. Paul says this, I let go of what's behind, I reach to what's ahead. He's describing a 40. And that doesn't mean that it's all going to be lollipops, sunshine, and rainbows. That, a lot of times, that, that how did Noah go through that cleansing? The entire population of the earth except those on the boat died. Jesus went through the wilderness 40 days and nights without food. The list continues. 
And so we go through storms in our life as well. God, he's saying, look, I've given you the five. I've given you my grace so that you can eight. You can go to your new beginning so that there can be a 40 in your life to go from the place you've been to the place that I've called you to go. It's not always going to be pretty and it's not always going to be pleasant. But even if it's in a valley, I will be with you. If it's in a storm, I'll calm it down. If it's in a fire, I'll reveal myself in it on your behalf. If you're in a wilderness, I will be your very near and present help. And so we have the number 40 plus the number 10. 10 is also extremely significant. And trust me, I'm going somewhere with this, so just bear with me. Every time we see the number 10, it's a test. Tithing is 10%. He says, test me in this. The plagues of Egypt, there were 10. He was testing Pharaoh. And also the children of Israel, are they going to have faith to trust? And in Pentecost, again, Jesus was around for 40 days. Then he ascended and he said, go into all the world and make disciples and baptize and preach and do all these amazing things. I'm sending you out as, as lambs among wolves. I'm giving you a supernatural mandate that requires supernatural power. There's only one problem. You don't have any. So he says, go, but wait. And the Bible says that he appeared to 500. And I believe that all 500 went to the upper room. He said, go and wait until you're endued with power. But yet in Acts 2, it says that there were only 120. And so what happened in that time? There were those that failed the test. The majority of people left. The majority, look, we got to start ministry. You know, my wife called me done four times. I got to go, you know, I'm just, how many of y'all like to wait? I mean, seriously, you guys remember dial up? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you, you get on the internet, go click, you know, check in your email or bank account or something. You click it, you go get some coffee, make a sandwich, come back in. It's half loaded, you know. Now, if the screen takes more than half a second to load, we're like throwing the mouse across the room. No, we don't like to wait. And this was the test. Jesus was saying, look, it's not enough that I show up to you in resurrection power. Now you need to wait and trust me that the, the rest is going to come. See, Jesus said, I'm breathing on you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Here's a deposit. He said, but you're about to cash out and get the whole thing here in a minute. And that's what it means in Acts 2 when it said, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Because even though they had celebrated many Pentecosts in the past, it was a prophetic picture of the day. This is what it was all pointing to. God was saying, now I'm going to give you the power that as you've gone through this season of transition and cleansing and preparation and grace and this new beginning, as you have passed the 10 days of the waiting and of the test, and I got a word for somebody here tonight that God is about to bless you and you're feeling struggle in the waiting where there's this tension and this frustration and there's a temptation to leave. And I hear the spirit of the Lord saying to you, stay where you are because the answer is coming as you wait. And so finally, they passed the test. Pentecost, 50, the day had fully come. And it says the power of the Holy Spirit was poured out into that place. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there is so much to this verse. But I want to focus on just for a couple of more minutes, the Holy Spirit. The first thing that it says before the Holy Spirit fell is that there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Now, I work on F-16 fighter jets, right? So those jokers are loud. They can fly up to Mach 2, which is twice the speed of sound, which is 1,150 feet per second at sea level. They can fire 6,000 rounds per minute or 100 rounds per second. They only hold 510 rounds, so you got five seconds of fire. Done. 
That's how fast that gun fires. The flight controls move that aircraft going at that speed that quick because those flight controls are under 3,000 PSI of hydraulic pressure. So this is a powerful machine. And, and, and it doesn't stop there. That it can also be configured with many different types of, of external fuel tanks and missiles and bombs and all of these different things. And as impressive as an F-16 is, it is nothing compared to the omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent Holy Spirit that never runs out of ammo or f fuel and will be with you in the fire, the storm, the valley, or the wilderness. See, it says that the Holy Spirit came like a mighty rushing wind. And us all living in Tucson by the base and by the airport, we know when one of our jets are up in the air. The whole city knows. And this is what was going on the day of Pentecost. They, they heard a sound. There was this wind that blew through that woke everybody up. Something was going on with this wind. We've heard of uh, many, many messages about the fire, the tongues, and, and, and uh, the preaching, and all of that is amazing, and it's extremely important. But I want to focus for just a second on the wind. What was this wind about? Remember, Pentecost has to do with the wheat harvest. There were no factories or, or tractors. Wheat had to be separated by, from the shaft. So it grows up in a stalk and there is, um, there, there's, uh, this plant material that encases all of the grain. So you have to break it out and each individual grain comes out. If you were to do this by hand, you would starve to death before you got, ever got enough to make some bread. And so what they would do is, if you can go to the next slide, please. They would heap up all of this fresh cut wheat and they would move it around to kind of break it up and they would wait until a wind came. They would take this wheat, throw it up into the air and the wind would take away all the shaft, the stuff that's not grain, the inedible stuff and all the grain would fall to the ground. So by the time they were done, they were left with a huge pile of grain and all the stuff that was unedible has been blown away. Jesus used analogies of grain and bread to bring a, 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 you know, a great deal during his ministry. And it makes sense. He was talking to farmers and a lot of people who, even if they weren't farmers, they, they understood farming. And John the Baptist also used this imagery. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, it says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to carry. Listen to this. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then he talks to us about what that means. It says his winnowing fan, that's a thing that they would throw the chaff up with, the way we would think of it as a pitchfork. His winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out the threshing floor, uh, his church, his people, and gather his wheat into the barn, heaven, and he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. I'll leave that one there. See, the Holy Spirit is the wind that drives out the chaff in our lives. Wind brings change. It brings life. And where there's no wind, there's no way to separate the grain, the substance from the chaff, the, the, the filler, the, the, the frivolous. And so how do you know if your church or life is stale or lifeless? It's not just by how you feel. It can be defined by the lack of wind or movement of the Holy Spirit. If there's no wind, you're forced to eat the little grain that you do have while chewing on all of the inedible roughage of the chaff. Now, I've been around people that instead of getting grain from them, you're just getting a bunch of grass. And it's not a good taste. And God doesn't want that for his church. He says, I don't want you to, to have 1% of something that's good for somebody and the rest of it just be a bunch of religious minutia. Jesus did not come to establish a religion. He came to buy you back into his family. He came to have a relationship with you and to give you the power of his Holy Spirit so that you can look like him, walk like him, talk like him, and act like him all the while while being the best you, the perfect you that he created you to be. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 through 27, uh, it says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then the earth shook 
But now he is promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as things that are made, um, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. So it's using this imagery of that, that the Holy Spirit will come to shake things up so that there, there's life and substance and fruitfulness in you, but he has to get rid of all of the frivolous and all of the things that are, that are just eating up time and space and that are not good for anything. The enemy is a liar. Sometimes the storm, it's not there to drown you, but to blow away those things that keep you from having a life and life more abundantly that are keeping you from your purpose. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 through 32, Jesus looks at Peter right in the face and he says something interesting. Simon, Simon. Now, what's great about this, see, God has a sense of humor. And even though this moment is very serious, he named Peter, changed his name to Peter, which meant uh, rock. But right here, he's calling him Simon, Simon. He usually did that when it was, he was in trouble. So was he in trouble here? No. But Jesus needed to get his attention. Look, this isn't, this, this isn't a friendship conversation. When I am speaking to you as God. You need to understand what I'm about to say. And it's significant because Simon literally means listen. Jesus was saying, listen, Peter. Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. That when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. See, this verse, it, it messes me all kinds of up. Satan asked to mess with Peter. And we would think, oh, well, Jesus is my homeboy. He's got my back. He's going to tell Satan no. And now he said, I pray your faith wouldn't fail, meaning he told Satan yes. Satan said, I'm going to jack him up. Jesus said, all right. But notice what he says. I've prayed for you. How many of you love that Jesus prays for us? I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail. He says, and how this shaking is going to happen, you're going to leave me. You're going to turn your back on me. You're going to disown me. But when you return. See, even before G Peter left, Jesus told him, you're coming back. And I feel like that's what Jesus told me when I walked away. You're coming back. Strengthen your brethren. And so Peter, he was sifted at Passover, but empowered at Pentecost. Let's continue to read this. In Acts 2, it says, again, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting because Peter had gone through a sifting, and now the Holy Spirit was removing all of the flesh. Why did Jesus allow Peter to go through that sifting? He said, look, you're going to lead the church, and you're going to lead the leaders to ultimately give their lives for this thing, and it's going to transform the entire world. This isn't a game. And so all of that stuff that's on the inside of you that, that is stealing your time, energy, and resources, and attention, I need to remove the shaft so that I can keep the grain because that's grain that I want to feed my people with. And it said that after the Holy Spirit fell, in verse 14, it says, Peter then standing up with the 11, because they heard the tongues and saw what was going on. They said, they're having a crazy party over there. They're, they're talking nuts and they're lighting each other on fire they must be wasted i've been to some parties like that and so peter stands up and he says these men are not drunk as you suppose he said men of judea and all who dwell in jerusalem be this known to you and heed my words for these people are not drunk as you suppose but since the, the it is only the third hour of the day it's 9 a.m that's way too early to be getting crazy he said, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes Joel chapter 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And he's not just talking about men. He says that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, that your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men's servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy, and it shall come to pass past that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the only thing the people that heard this could respond, this says they were cut to the heart. And they said, what do we do? And he said, I'll tell you what to do. Repent of your sin, turn to God, 
Be baptized in the name of Jesus, you and your whole household, and you'll be saved. And it says in verse 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Today we celebrate the birth of the church, the Father's offering of Jesus so death could pass over us, the giving of his Holy Spirit so that we can now be laborers in the field with the, word, with the world, gathering in a harvest of sons and daughters for the kingdom. If you need forgiveness of sin, Jesus is here. If you feel cold and stale, chewing on dry chaff, and just know in your life there's got to be more than this, the Holy Spirit is here to blow away and to burn up the chaff so that, and to fill you tonight with himself to empower you. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would breathe, that you would blow, that you would have uh, Genesis 2-7, that you would breathe into your people again, that you would make us alive. Lord, I'm praying for a revival in my own life. I'm praying for a revival in our church. I'm praying for a revival in our community and in our nation. Lord, we're asking that Holy Spirit, that this would not just be a day that we talk about nice things, but Holy Spirit, we would experience a Pentecost in our lives, that it would mean something in our generation and for our children and our children's children. God, we are asking Holy Spirit that you would fall once again, that you would blow away those things that are stealing, killing, and destroying us, that we would be left with the knowledge of you, that we would be transformed from glory to glory as we behold you by your power. In Jesus' name.